certainly thank the Lord for bringing us into a new year. And we trust that uh, the Lord will provide us with blessings as we open the word. And we um, wait in his presence for something to feed us. He knows what our needs are. We are indeed a needy people. And it's good that we can come to him in times of need to find refreshment. Now, our topic for today is uh, return and recovery. For me, it's a very refreshing and um, positive and encouraging topic. You know, it suggests moving from what is negative to something positive. It's always good to go from failure and barrenness to fruitfulness and, and blessing. And I think our topic speaks of moving from sorrow, as we would trace some uh, um, portions of scripture, moving from sorrow to rejoicing, going from a place outside the will of God to being in the current of his will. But you know, return and recovery, I think, uh, always follows failure and departure. A number of years ago, a brother said to me, he said, Wes, you know, God has the best in store for us. It's a very profound statement, I believe. Departure and failure somehow seems to question this mind of God, that God has the best in store for his people. Failure to appreciate what God has in store for us. Failure to appropriate, to lay hold on, to somehow enter in at all that God has made available for us. These are the root causes of departure. Departure results from us not following the path that God has mapped out for us, but also our choosing our own path. God has the best in store for you. Being in a place, in any place, less than what God has in mind is settling for second best. And this is a challenge for you and it's a challenge for me. As an assembly, that we occupy the place the Lord expects us to occupy. That as individuals, that I am in this spiritual condition, I am in the place that the Lord expects. The question is, can God's richest blessing attend us, attend you, attend me, when we are in a pathway of disobedience, when we are outside of his will. You know, if you're here this afternoon who do not know the Lord Jesus as Savior, I want to say to you that God has the best in store for you. You may have turned your back and you may have wandered far from him, 
But the message to you this afternoon is that he loves you still. He wants you to come back. He wants you to return. And so as we consider this topic of return and recovery, I wonder if there is a word, first of all, for any who do not know the Lord Jesus as Savior. And I want us to look at Luke 15. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 15. And we want to read together from verse 11. In Luke chapter 15, verse 11, it says, the Lord Jesus speaking, he says, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he, the father, divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swines. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swines did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many Hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose, came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran, fell on his neck, covered him with kisses. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, but the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, put a shoe on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be in want. I think this story of the prodigal son, this parable the Lord Jesus gave, gives a wonderful uh, illustration of the waywardness of the heart of man. But it also speaks of the love of the father's heart. This young man, let's look, we go through, as we go through that parable, it seems as if the Lord Jesus shines a spotlight, first of all, on the young man. And then he shines a spotlight on the father. And then lastly, there was an elder brother 
And maybe later on this afternoon or maybe tomorrow we'll touch a little bit about the elder brother. But let us first of all consider this young man. The wayward heart of the sinner. He represents one who is unsaved, an unbeliever, who does not know the Lord Jesus as Savior. There is departure and there is distance. And so we have that sin has separated. The word of God says your sins have separated you from God. Sinful man, man, natural man, wants to put distance between himself and God. All his actions and all his behavior, as it were, they're contrary to the mind of God and contrary to the will of God. He wants no constraints, no subjection, no um, submission. He wants what might be called freedom. And there are many today who, like this young man, they want to relieve themselves from any constraints. They want to, as they call it, live it up. So he puts distance between himself and the Father. And so um, we find that he went after fun. And I was thinking he had friends. And strangely enough, he had the funds to pay for all of that, funds that he didn't labor for. And, you know, people might think that that is really living life. That you know you had money and funds and friends and everything else. And without any constraints, without any responsibility. He didn't have to answer to anyone. And you know some might say that is the good life. But the word of God says if we look at what the scripture says. It says he wasted. It is as if the Spirit of God would write over what he thought was fun and, and having a good time. The Word of God, the Spirit of God writes over it, waste. What a waste. No profit, no gain. And so we find that his whole life, as it were, was as it were a waste. The Spirit of God says that um, what shall it profit a man? If he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And then we find that there was no satisfaction, no real um, a profit. There was emptiness and there was void. And so we read that he began to be in one. And notice, he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And of course, no one would help him. No one would give him anything. Oftentimes, you know, there's a lot today about self-help. To do something to better your situation. And this young man, he found himself in a predicament. We read there was a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. There was distance and degradation. He joined himself to a citizen as if he was going lower and lower. And then we find that he, the citizen, sends him to feed swines. And we know the story. There is want and there is hunger and husk. And so he wanted to, to, as it were, escape the sad results of his own actions. And many today try to, as it were, do something to escape the results, the judgment of God, what God had said concerning sin. And they try different things. This young man, he went, he joined himself. He tried to correct things. He tried to fix things. He tried to make things right on his own terms, as it were. And there are many today who are still doing that. Friend, if you're here this afternoon who do not know the Lord Jesus as Savior, and you like this young man, find yourself in a distant place away from God. And you find yourself being in want where there's no satisfaction for that hurst or for that hunger or thirst that you're experiencing. If you find yourself this afternoon like this young man, then the answer is not self-reformation. I mean, not changing your habits. It's not changing a new leaf. It's not reformation. It's not making resolution. We've just come into a new year. 
and people oftentimes when they have to deal with them with their sins you know there was a a, a a program it says when they have to face themselves and to think then they decide to make changes i'm going to change a new leaf i'm going to do this i'm going to do better they make resolutions this young man i think he made all the resolutions that he could he did all the things he could do to help himself and we read that it made no difference. Thank God. It says he came to himself. We have an expression that he came to his senses. This afternoon, dear ones, if you're here who do not know the Lord Jesus the Savior, we trust that you might come to your senses. Make an assessment of where you are in relationship to God. And then we find what he says. He says that I will arise and I will go to my father. See, no one could help him. And he couldn't help himself. And I think he came to this point that he couldn't help himself. He could do nothing to better his situation. And no one could help him. And so we read that it says he came to himself. And it is when he thought of the father's house, when he thought of the goodness of the father, how the father treats even the servants. It says that the many hired servants, they had bread enough and to spare. The goodness of the father, even to the servant, he recognized. That being in a place, even as a footman in the father's house, was better than being in the far country. And so he says, I will arise. And I will go unto my father. And I will tell my father that I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And so there once I want to make the point that we have before us, uh, repentance. He did what he was supposed to do. He arose. And then he came back to the Father. Now I want to ask, my, I want to ask you, what would he expect? What can he expect from his Father? I was thinking that this is a very disrespectful young man. He had dishonored his Father. And he had disrespected his father. He had done serious injury to his father, I believe. In those days, it was when the father died that the inheritance went on to the children. He was the younger brother, and I think he was entitled to the third. But his attitude and his actions were, he said to the father in essence, I can't wait for you to die. You, you're sticking around too long. I can't wait. I want my portion. What a disrespect. And what could he expect from the father as he comes back? What was going through his heart? What was going through his mind? As he leaves the far country and he would step every step closer to home. And he would thought to himself, all that I could expect is some position of servitude. All that I could expect is to become a servant in my father's house. And that would be a whole lot better than being in a far country. And there once the Spirit of God would have us consider quickly how the father deals with this young man. We see grace and we see forgiveness. The word says that while he was a yet, while he was yet a far way off, the father saw him. He expected him. I think the old man was looking for him. The Bible says that he ran and he met him in the distance, as it were, fell on his neck and covered him with kisses. What a reception. He says to the father, I have sinned. 
And dear ones, as we're going to trace this afternoon, confession, repentance, and confession is always a place to begin. He says, I have sinned. God expects us to own up and to confess, not to hide, not to cover, but to own up, to confess. And he says, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the next thing we know, he was going to say, make me a servant. But as it were, the father interjects, the father stops him, he said, that's enough. He tells the servants now to serve him. Think of the rags of the far country. Think of what he comes back, what he brings back. And the father says, you know, bring the best robe. Not any robe. Not bring an old robe. Put it on him. Bring a shoe and put him on his feet. The father, as it were, elevated him, put him into a position of dignity. And the father took him at his own table, as it were, and to have fellowship and communion with him. There once it's far above what he expected. What grace does goes far above and beyond. When he came back into the father's house, into a place of nearness and in a condition that was suitable to the father's house. Something that was expressive of the father's own heart. I think he thought he did not deserve that. But this is expressive of the father's love. What a welcome. What a reception. It was beyond what he expected. And then the portion says, that he, uh, there was joy and there was rejoicing. So there are blessings in coming back. There are blessings in returning. God is still, as it were, calling the sinner. And if you this afternoon, dear one, are like that prodigal son who have found yourself away from God, as it were, the darkness and in the distance. There is hunger and there is want and there is husk and all that is attendant to being away from God. I want to tell you this afternoon that a warm welcome awaits you. As it were, God is calling you, expects you to come. That's not his plan for you. That's not his desire. He would have you in a place of nearness to himself and a place of blessing. And so that's the gospel word for, the, for any this afternoon who do not know the Lord Jesus as Savior. But is there a word for those of us, dear ones, you and I, who know the Lord Jesus as Savior? Could there be departure and the clension in the believer as well? Is it possible that you or I, we have left the place that God has marked out for us? and chosen a path of our own. You know, I would like us to look at a couple of examples this afternoon. And I had before me the book of Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1. And I have some of these slides on the... Okay, the life of Naomi. One more. Luke chapter one. No, you can go forward. Yeah. Ruth chapter one. In Ruth chapter one, I want us to consider briefly uh, Departure and return as it concerns the believer. It says, It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled 
that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the man's name was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took themselves wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpha, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Malan and Chilion died also both of them, and the woman was bereft of her husband and her two sons. The first chapter in the book of Ruth, it gives us a panoramic view of a believer's departure and return. The first verses, it gives the condition of things in the time in which they live. And you know, there are ones, as we go through the scriptures, God, as it were, gives us examples of people, and the Spirit of God tells us the time, the day in which they were living. And the Spirit of God would highlight for us men and women who were faithful in their day, and in their time, and the circumstance in which they found themselves. And I want us as we go through that we would also examine in the light of our day and our time, and how are we living in this day in which we find ourselves. We have before us, as it were, the Spirit of God talks about the whole country. The condition of things, you might say, nationwide. In these first verses, it speaks of this the land of Bethlehem, Judah, in a broad sense, what was going on. The spotlight then focuses on a family. So there are national events, national things. But then there are domestic things in a family situation. And then we have the individuals, each individual in a family. And I want us to suggest, I want to suggest as we go along and look at these portions, and we want to use a limelight, first of all, as a believer who has backslidden, one who is outside of the place that God would have him to be. But I want us to consider as we go along that there are individual responsibility. There is a responsibility for you and for me individually to be faithful in the circumstance, in the scene in which I find myself. And there can be departure and there can be failure, declension, away from the place where God would have me to be. Never mind what goes on, you might say, in the broader sphere. There might be problems in the larger sphere. Maybe in the home, maybe in the assembly, maybe in the country. But God still expects me to be faithful in the circumstance that he has placed me in. And so we find this man, this family, first of all, living in this place, Bethlehem, Judah. If you turn back one page, it says in our portion, 
that it was in the days in which the judges ruled. I wonder if for a few minutes we could go back and look very quickly, if you turn back one page, I think, from Ruth chapter 1. It brings you back to Judges. And in Judges, the last book, I mean the last chapter, and the last verse, verse 25 of chapter 21, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, in the book of Ruth, we notice, very first verse, it says, It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Two things characterize, we'll look at some other things as we go along, but two things I wanted to highlight. There was no king, no rule, no authority, nothing to um, submit to, and every man did who was right in his own eyes, please himself. If we go back in the book of Judges, a few, chapter, few uh, chapters, we would see the sad, sad condition of things. If we turn back to chapter 17, Judges chapter 17. There we have idolatry. In verse 5, we read of this man, Micah. The man Micah had a house of gods. He made an ephod, teraphim, consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, verse 6, there were no king in Israel. And every man did what was right in his own heart. He introduced idolatry. If you go through, very quickly we can trace maybe chapter 18 of Judges. We find um, in those days there was no king. And here we have a whole tribe, the Danites. And then we go down to verse 3. They were going to find a place where they're going to set up, it says, an, inher uh, 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 an inheritance for themselves. And we come to verse 3. And they came to the house of Micah. And then they recognized the voice of this young man who had become his priest. And they turned in there. And they said unto him, Who brought thee here? And what doest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And then he answered them, he said, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me. And he had hired me, and I am his priest. He's a hired priest. You go down to chapter, um, to verse 17 of the same chapter. We read that um, some men went to spy out. Verse 18. And when they came to Micah's house, they fetched the carved image and the ephod and the teraphim and swan and the molten image. And they said unto the priests, um, unto them, uh, and the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be a father and a priest. It is better for thee to be a priest 
unto the house of one man, or is it better to be a priest of a whole tribe in Israel? Confusion. Idolatry. This was what existed in the days when the judges ruled. Now, this is the day in which we have Ruth setting. If you go chapter 18 and 19, there is adultery and gross wickedness. If you read in chapter 19, the gross wickedness in the, uh, that takes place. If you go to verse 20 of uh, chapter 19 very quickly. Sorry, chapter, chapter 20, we could read verse 3. It says, um, the end of verse 3, tell us how was this wickedness? They're asking the, the man that it happened to. And the man of Gibeah, um, sorry, verse 4. And the Levite, the husband of the woman who had was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belonged to Benjamin, I and my concubine. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about and thought that they would have slain me and my concubine. And they forced her and she is dead. And so he, I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Such is the condition of things in the days when the judges ruled. And lastly, uh, there is civil war and there's destruction in the days division when the judges ruled. But um, in chapter eight, sorry, chapter um, 19, I want us to turn quickly to verse 29, chapter 19. We read that this man, when he came to his house, he was from Bethlehem, Judah, or his concubine was from Bethlehem, Judah, that he laid his hand, took her, cut her in pieces, and he sent her throughout all the borders of Bethlehem, Judah. So my point is that there was gross sin and wickedness all around. And every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. If you follow the story of the Levite, the young man, he was also from Bethlehem, Judah. In chapter 19, it says that uh, in verse 1, it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, there was a certain Levite sojourning in Mount Ephraim. And he took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. So we find this concubine was connected with, con with uh, Bethlehem Judah. We find this young man who was the Levite, the priest, he was connected with Bethlehem Judah. And if you read the account, if you go through, you would see that he was actually a grandson of Moses. He was a son of Gershom, a grandson of Moses. Gross sin and idolatry and idolatry in the land. And so when we come to Ruth chapter 1, we have this family. And the nice thing about it, it says that this man, he uh, was living in Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread. His name was Elimelech. 
God is king. My God is king. And his wife, Naomi, her name means pleasant. Pleasantness. How refreshing in a way. That in the midst of all this confusion and evil and idolatry and war and all that's going on. Because if you look at the end of, of the, 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 the chapters we have in the end of Judges, actually it's like an appendix. It belongs to what was going on actually in the times when the Judges were ruling. But in the midst of all of this, there is this little family. And he was saying by his name, by his profession... My God is king. Never mind what's going on out there. Never mind all the confusion, all that's happening. Every time somebody called them, Elimelech, he was saying it was a testimony as it were. It was a profession. My God is king. And his wife, pleasantness. Wonderful expression, is it not? And yet we find that we read that he left. It says that he left. No, we're going forward. Back, back. Some more. Back. Yeah. This one? one back. One more. One more. Okay. He left the place that he was supposed to be. He left. I thought we got the wrong version. <laughs> he left Bethlehem, Judah, and he went to Moab to sojourn. And this is my point. Elimelech, he had a profession. He was saying in essence that this, all this confusion and no one is bowing to any um, uh, 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 authority. But for me, my God is king. But what we find is that when the trials and the difficulties came, that he did not act in accordance with, to the profession that he made. He acted outside of the will of God. Bethlehem Judah was the place that he was supposed to have been. That's the place that God had appointed out for them. That's the place where he was supposed to be. Now testing and trials will come to us as believers. We do not escape testings and trials. But you know, as it were, they, 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 they probe for the, 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 um, the, our faith. They probe to see if really we believe what we testify to. And in the world in which we live, it's a similar day in which Elimelech found himself. We have a day where people want no constraints. They live, as it were, outside. They live in freedom. They want freedom. They want to do their own thing. And they want no subjection, as it were. No king. Lawlessness. And we find them doing their own thing. Selfishness. This man, Elimelech, his profession was that God was king. It's as if believers, you and I, in the scene in which we live, it's like we say, the, uh, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, he's my Lord. And so I'll bow to his authority, his lordship. Whatever I do is in subjection to him, what he would have me to do. But here we find Elimelech acting outside of that profession. Elimelech leaves Bethlehem, Judah, and he goes down to Moab. Now Moab is a type of the world. 
we have different examples of different uh, uh, nations that surrounded people of God that were types of the world. Egypt is presented as a type of the world. But Egypt presents the world from the point of view of its pleasures and its treasures. Babylon is also a type of the world. And Babylon speaks of the religious world. But Moab, Moab speaks of the world as it were with the ease, no exercise, no trials, so to speak. This man, Elimelech, when the trials and the difficulties came, he left his God-given place and he went down to Moab. He and his family. He, as it were, was seeking to escape the judgment of God, seeking to avoid the exercise and the trials that the Lord would put him through. And he wanted, as it were, to carve out an easier path for himself and his family. And they go down to Moab. We read that Elimelech died in Moab. The very thing he was trying to avoid. The very thing he was trying to escape, as it were, he died in Moab. If we go back to the account with a young man we read of, that priest, he was from Bethlehem, Judah. And he had done something that was not what he was supposed to do. He was in the wrong place. My point is, because the priest had done it, was no excuse for Elimelech. God still held him accountable and responsible for the profession that he made. So Elimelech brings before us backsliding, not being in the will of God, pleasing self, denying the Lordship of Christ. And there are ones I wonder if sometimes Moab doesn't have an attraction for you and for me. Sometimes we reject, as it were, some of the grosser things that uh, uh, would tempt us, as it were. But sometimes it is... Uh, the ease and the comfort. We don't want to be exercised. We don't want to have to go through trials and difficulties. We try to escape, as it were, anything that would cause us to, um, to grow spiritually, to make movement, uh, uh, to move in relationship to our spiritual growth. And so that we might be here for testimony and witness for the Lord Jesus. So Elimelech, we read that he died in Moab. thinking that you have the wrong one. <laughs> so Elimelech brings before us leaving. Go back. Back one. Leaving the place that God has marked out for us, trying to avoid trials and um, circumstances, 
looking for easy path, seeking to please sense, seeking to please self, and uh, being outside of God's will. I still think we... Yeah. I think uh, we have... Be the, the wrong one. Okay, so you have the wrong one. I don't have the right one. No, <laughs> sorry. Okay. So we're saying that in terms of Elimelech, it's a warning that we need to take heed to leave the God's appointed uh, God's appointed place, taking the path of a backslider and continuing in a false position. And what we have in Elimelech is that there is no return, no recovery. Elimelech died in Moab. What Elimelech did also affected his family. It affected his wife. It affected his children. The point that we wanted to make, and we don't have the slides up, is that God also has a purpose even in famine. There is a lesson that we can learn, even as we go through circumstances in this pathway, trials. God has a lesson for us to learn. And uh, uh, because of the sin that was going on in the land at the time, because of the difficulties, we find that God came in in judgment. And God's people had to experience the judgment of God because of sin. And that should have exercised uh, Elimelech. To be in the path that God would have us to be is going to cost us something. There is sacrifice often associated in us being in the place that God would have us to be. And the danger, the, the attraction is to try to get to an easier path, an easier place, to somehow escape the, the trials and to escape uh, 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 what God might allow to happen. And so what we do is we find ourselves in uh, Moab. We find ourselves in a place where there's no exercise. We find ourselves in a place where there is no growth. And so um, Elimelech serves as a warning the Spirit of God would have us to look at this man as a believer who is in a backslidden state. There was no recovery. He never returned. He never, he went to sojourn, as it were. It is as if he was going to go there for a short amount of time. We read that he died there. There once oftentimes, the choices that we make, the decisions that we make, the things that we do, if we are outside of God's will, if we are in a backslidden state, it's going to affect our family. It affects us. But it's going to have an effect on our families and those that are around us. And what we find is, in the case of Elimelech, is that they went down there and he died there. We read that his kids died there. And so what happens to Naomi is that she buried in this land of Moab where they had just gone to sojourn. She buried her loved ones there. I wonder if there is a warning for us that if we are outside of the will of God, there are serious consequences for us personally. But there are also serious consequences that affect those around us, our loved ones. He sought to escape God's hand of judgment. God's discipline 
Now, God was going to provide for him. He was being exercised, he was being tested. The reality of his faith, as it were, was being tested. The reality of his profession. He was walking around his name. God is my king. My God is king. That was the profession that he made. And as it were, as it, God would, would hold him to it. There was the warning for you and for me. We profess to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. We profess the Lordship of Christ. That we bow to the Lordship of Christ. But in our actions and in our attitude, are we really representing this? Are we really showing this? What we say with our mouth, does that come through in terms of the reality in our lives? That Christ is really Lord. And whatever we do is in accordance with his lordship. And this was the challenge for Elimelech. This was the challenge for him. This was his exercise. This was his test. Now you claim that God is your king. Live it out. Demonstrate it. Practically. In the place where God would have you to be. So I wanted us to use, and our slide is not working, but I wanted us to use this man, Elimelech, as a warning. It's a warning of a backslidden believer, one who is backslidden, a backslider. You know, a backslider is not a nice term. None of us want to be called or to be, you know, uh, identified as, as backslider. And so the Spirit of God would bring before us, as it were, this man Elimelech. We look at the conditions under which he was living. We look at his profession. We look at the test of his witness, as it were. And how, when the trials came, we read that he went down to Moab. Not only he went there, the Word of God says he went to sojourn. As it were, as going for a short time. Ten years later, we read, we read, and they continued. I wanted to show them. They continued. No, it's not. I have to change the slide. They continued there. They went to sojourn. They went for a short time. But they continued. And then we find this tragedy in the family of this, this man. His wife, his children. They married the women of Moab. You know, somebody says that sometimes as believers, we, we seek the things of the world. Our children often go further. They seek the world itself. This man, his children, again, outside of the will of God, they married wives of Moab. He continued in a false position. There was no recovery. God has a purpose, has a lesson for us, even in a famine. Elimelech failed to learn that lesson. So when we began, we began, we spoke of the prodigal son. It was a gospel message. That God has the best in store. God has the best in store for us, for you, for me. It is when we fail to really appreciate that truth. When we fail to, to enter into it. Then we, we depart. Then we wander away. Then, as it were, the pathway that he has marked out for us 
seem to be too straight. And we choose a pathway of our own. But uh, God is a God of return and of recovery. And anyone, whether you do not know the Lord Jesus as Savior, or if you're one who know the Lord Jesus as Savior, and you are somehow, in any degree, outside of what God would really have you to be, you are somehow a little deviated from what God would really want of you. Then we are not in the place of richest blessings. And God's desire is that he might have you, have his people in close relationship to himself. So as believers, we also can be in that place that represents departure and a place that is away from where God would have us to be. Now, our next topic, we want to look at Naomi, and we want to look at return. So after the break, we want to, by the help of the Lord, to see return and restoration as represented in Naomi. How the Spirit of God would show us that there is failure, but there is also return and recovery. There are blessings associated in being in the place where God would have us to be. There might be a cost. There is going to be exercise. It costs more. It costs more of us to be in the place where God would have us to be than to be in a place of our own choosing. And this is the challenge for you and for me. That God would have us to recognize where he would have us, and where we are in relationship to that place. So God grant that as we come back to the next half of our lecture, that we would see the positive side of return and recovery, for his name's sake.